So welcome to the webinar where we want to present the Blockstart training program for healthcare manufacturers. My name is Jana Fesseler. I work for Bioregio Stern. We are a project partner of Blockstart. And together with our French colleagues, uh, Daniela Onofri from Medicin, we organized this webinar. And yes, we're happy to have you here. And yeah. So first of all, we're having a short look at the agenda. And I will first take the opportunity to give you a short introduction to the Blockstart project and also for the Blockstar training program. And afterwards, our first expert speaker, Anka Petre from Gen3 Consulting will talk about the blockchain in data security and the traceability of essential drugs. Our second expert, Christoph Kieselbach from Schrag & Partner is sharing insights on the medical device regulations of digital health devices. Blockstart is an indirect Northwest Europe project and was set up to help the SMEs in from the sectors of agri-food, healthcare and logistics and to find out more about blockchain opportunities in their sectors and eventually implement them too. The, pro the project started in January 2019 and will run until September 2022. We have a total budget of 4.9 million euros and almost 3 million euros are funded by Indirect Northwest Europe themselves. We are quite a big consortium. We are nine project partners and we are from the countries of the Netherlands, France, Belgium, United Kingdom and Germany. And some of our partners are business support organizations just like we are or other partners are blockchain experts themselves. And we're also having 17 associated partners to, who will help us finding experts and getting the project enrolled. Maybe you ask yourself, why blockchain for SMEs? We think it's an upcoming technology that is not yet grasped by many SMEs. But we also think blockchain has a huge and relevant potential and can cut costs and risks. To give you an idea, we listed some examples. Blockchain can be very beneficial when you want to track your shipments across different organizations. So speaking of logistics here. One example for the health sector could be sharing sensitive data between fractioners. Or blockchain can help to assure quality, safety and the origin of food for the agri-food sector. We also know SMEs are vulnerable to risks, but those risks can be solved by blockchain technologies quite easily. But the SMEs often don't have the capacity to invest in these solutions by themselves. This is why we came up with the SME training program. It's a free training program to increase awareness and understanding of how blockchain technologies will impact your sector and business. The program is tailored to your needs. You can choose from a wide range of options, including training sessions, workshops and webinars. We realize you all have very different backgrounds and you, you all work on very different challenges within your companies. Therefore, it is important to find the right modules to meet your specific requests. I recommend you to get in touch with us so we can check with our experts and yeah, check with them which modules might fit best to your needs. If you want to have a closer look at the guidelines, the training program modules themselves or the application form, you will find them on the project website of the Blockstart, which is hyperlinked here, or you can just easily scan the QR code on the right. This was already the project introduction from my side, and now I would pass on to the next slides from our speaker, Anka Petre. Well, thank you very much for having me today. Um, I will be giving you a broad overview of some of the lessons that I've learned in the past five years working on blockchain projects and specifically in healthcare. So I want to dive right into today's topic uh, so you can get straight away an understanding of the, block, the, the impact that blockchain can have in healthcare. And I wanted to share with you as an introduction the story of the very first implementation of this technology in a healthcare setting. The story starts in April 2014 when American news channel CNN announces that over 40 veterans 
died while waiting for care in a hospital in Phoenix, Arizona. What you need to understand is that in the US, these hospitals need to attend patients in a maximum of 14 days. Patients cannot wait longer than 14 days to be taken care of. One of the stories that was really uh, moving was that of Thomas Brin. He was a 71 years old uh, Navy veteran and he was rushed to that hospital in Phoenix because he had blood in his urine and a history of cancer. At the center, his family was told that he would have to wait seven months before being taken care of because the waiting list was so long. So he had to go back home and the family kept on calling and calling and calling again, trying to get an appointment, but that never happened. And Thomas Breen died a couple of months later and his death certificate later showed that he died from a bladder cancer. The history kept on repeating and the investigation that happened revealed that the waiting list were manipulated so that no waiting time exceeded the 14 days required by law. And this was extremely shocking for the people that read about this, um, this news. And after this revelation, what happened is that the U.S. government, when looking for startups that could help uh, try to come up with a solution to prevent any other hospital from manipulating waiting lists. And the solution came from a startup called Sava. And what this startup did is that they built a blockchain program that could store the waiting list so that no one could manipulate them. In this context, the reason that I'm using this example is because it's a very good example of how to correctly use blockchain in healthcare, but I guess in any other industry in general. And it really highlights what are the key success factors when working on a blockchain project. The first thing that makes blockchain a good uh, solution in this example is that it's actually the only technology that answers to the problem. And you need to make sure when you work on a blockchain project that you are using the correct technology, you're making the correct technical choices. And I know this might sound silly, but you would be surprised by the number of people that we see using blockchain just for the sake of using blockchain and not because it's actually the best technical choice out there. So how do you know that blockchain is the correct solution? Well, you pretty much follow the decision tree that you have in front of you. And this decision tree highlights that there are two um, scenarios in which blockchain could be used. The first one is when there's a real need to better trust uh, the data than if a central entity was the administrator. So if you cannot trust and center entity to administrate your data, then potentially you could use a blockchain technology. And then the second scenario is when there's a strong case for disintermediation. And that is, for example, if you make significant savings by um, removing middlemen. So these are pretty much the two scenarios where blockchain is really the correct tool to use. So if we go back to our story, blockchain was the correct choice for the following reasons. First of all, there was a very strong lack of trust in a single organization to manage the waiting list, and especially to ensure that no one modified those waiting lists. Second, there was a need for a shared and trusted source of data, and that was that famous waiting list. And third, there was a validated risk of data manipulation or falsification. If there's no risk of data manipulation, then maybe the data is not sensitive enough to justify using a blockchain. But then again, um, saying if blockchain is the right solution or not really depends on the use cases. Um, but making sure that blockchain is the right tool is not really enough for a project to be successful. And I want to give you another example of a successful implementation of blockchain, but this time in the food industry. So this story involves mangoes. 
when a sanitary crisis emerges in the food industry, um, from what we were told, it takes several days or even weeks to find the precise source. And to try to reduce these times, Walmart and IBM collaborated on a blockchain project, which you've probably heard of under the name Food Trust. And by using uh, blockchain, IBM and other food industry stakeholders, among which Walmart, wanted to improve traceability of their products. They also wanted to be able to act faster in case of a problem, and also avoid wasting products by only identifying those that are responsible for the problem or for the sanitary emergency. And one of the problem or the projects that IBM and Walmart developed was the traceability of mangoes. And I'll tell you straight away the results because when I first heard of them, I, I thought it was pretty impressive. So from um, these results come from someone at IBM that gave them to us. Uh, they told us that it took Walmart only 2.2 seconds instead of nine days to identify the provenance of the product and act in case of a problem. So you go from nine days to 2.2 seconds, which is a massive improvement. Now, why uh, was this project so success successful and what can we learn from it? The first thing that I believe is important is that blockchain was indeed the correct technology to solve this problem. Why? Because from what they explained to us, there was no really a consensus over a third party trusted by the whole ecosystem to take the famous role of administrator. So blockchain was really the only solution they had to ensure the integrity of the information without having to go through a third party. So it was really the most reliable and transparent way of operating. The second thing is that in order to be cost effective, a blockchain project needs to rely on digital data. What do I mean by that? Um, in some projects, we were faced with a lot of data that was on paper. And when you have data on paper, you first need to pass it on to a digital format before being able to put it on chain. And that requires a lot of human resources, a lot of different processes, and it also increases the risk of error. Then the last thing, which is extremely important in a blockchain project, is that you, know, you, you need a strong initial leadership. Um, a lot of stagnation happens in industries such as healthcare when it comes to blockchain projects because everyone is waiting for someone else to make the first step and to be the first one to implement a blockchain project. Now, in the food industry, Walmart decided to take leadership over the project and they built together with IBM this proof of concept. And once they had the proof of concept, they went to all the other partners and people they were working with, and they said, look, this is the proof of concept. They have, we have great results. Let's join forces and let's work together. And this is how they convinced everyone. And those that weren't convinced, at the end of the day, they were just forced to use it because everyone else was using it. So you need a strong initial leadership before building a consortium and have everyone sit at the same table. Now, knowing all this, you would think that the healthcare industry has all it needs to build successful projects using blockchain. But the truth is that's not what happens. Um, we try to understand why blockchain projects don't seem to work in healthcare. And when we try to understand why, it didn't really take much before we were able to clearly identify the problem in fact, we, we really just had to look at some of the requests that our clients made to see that something was really off. And in healthcare, we had this powerful tool that we call blockchain, and a lot of companies were trying to use it as best as they could. They knew it was something that was trending and they knew it was something that they had to use. But the problem is that they didn't know what was the problem that they were trying to solve with this tool. 
And I think this image is really interesting because it's just really like having a very powerful weapon and just shooting everywhere around you in the hope that at some point you will reach the target and you will win. So this is pretty much the situation that we saw happening in healthcare. Now, this doesn't mean that there are no successful projects using blockchain in healthcare. That's not what I want to say. Um, a lot of companies are doing fantastic things, but the, those are really um, very few cases. The majority of projects have been failing in healthcare um, because most of the clients that we had um, wanted us to tell them that blockchain was the answer, but they didn't want to take the time to see what was the initial question. So in other words, they had a solution, but it didn't, they didn't know what problem that solution was solving. And that was really, in our opinion, that was one of the main things that we had to solve with our clients before being able to uh, help them develop a successful project. Now, I want to jump into another story without any transition, and you'll understand later why. Um, I want to quote an article that I saw in the New York Times a couple of months ago, and I think that it might guide us toward, towards what is today the problem that we will be able to solve with blockchain. Now, you probably know that changing the consumer habits in the retail industry is very hard. I mean, we all use the same toilet paper and we all purchase the same yogurt brand, so we really don't change our habits. But there are some precise moments in a person's life when our buying habits have to change. And one of those moments, if not the most important moment, is around the birth of a child. And timing at that point is essential. Birth records are usually public in most countries. So the moment a couple have a new baby, they also they always receive a ton of targeted uh, material from different companies, a lot of uh, marketing material and things like that. So it's a really crucial moment for companies. Now, American company Target knew this very well, and they looked for a way to target expecting mothers as early as, as their second trimester, so they don't have to wait until the baby is born. And how do they do that? Just simply by analyzing buying patterns, which include things like uh, prenatal vitamins or mater maternity clothes. And about a year after Target created his the pregnancy prediction model, um, a man walked into a Target outside Minneapolis and he demanded to see the manager. He was holding in his hand coupons that were sent to his daughter and he was very angry because those coupons were for baby things. And he yelled that his daughter got this in the mail, that she was still in high school and that Target was encouraging her to get pregnant by sending her all these coupons. So of course the manager apologized and then he called again a few days later to apologize again. And on the phone that day, um, the father was a bit embarrassed and he answered and I quote, I had a talk with my daughter. It turns out there's been some activities in my house I haven't been completely aware of. She's due in August. I owe you an apology. Now, this story is quite funny, but when I first read the story, it really made me think about how some brands are able to collect a lot of data about us, a lot of health data, without us ever knowing. And I'm pretty sure that if I were in this situation, Target would have known about my pregnancy even maybe before my doctors or before my family. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that's concerned about the use of, our, of my health data. In fact, um, the European Commission ran a survey and 65% of participants said that they agreed to share their data, their health data, only if it's used by health professionals. Um, the use by public research organizations only convinced 21% of participants and the rate dropped to 15% when it came to the private sector 
whether it was for medical research or for commercial purposes. So it's clear that the patient's willingness to share their health data mainly depends on who uses it and how it is used. And although this problem has been around for quite some time, it really reached sort of a peak during the COVID-19 crisis when governments started talking about contact tracing applications. These apps are designed to track the people that we're in contact with, and if we ever test positive to COVID-19, they inform them that they have been exposed to a risk. And these apps um, appear in very different forms depending on the country, um, but I I'm not gonna get into details today about this. So the idea sounds quite good in theory, but in practice, what happened is that, especially in France, I don't know if it's the same in other countries, but it raised a lot of concerns about data privacy. And citizens don't really seem to trust their governments and or private companies to implement these kind of solutions without violating data confidentiality rules. So in the you know, post Snowden and post Cambridge Analytica era, trust when it comes to the secondary use of data is, seems to be broken. So these solutions don't use any blockchain. And I have to be honest, I'm not even sure that using blockchain here would be the right thing to do. Um, because it seems to me, but I, I could be mistaken, that mistrust is also strongly linked to misinformation and also lack of education about the technology in general that is used in those applications. So um, this lack of education and information is not something blockchain can address. However, uh, blockchain can create a stronger control over access to our personal data. And this is precisely what a project called My Health, My Data has spent the past couple of years developing. So My Health, My Data is a Horizon 2020 research and innovation action that's developing a patient-centric blockchain-based platform for, for sharing healthcare data. And the goal of this platform is, I quote from what they say, to be the first open biomedical information network centered on the connection between organizations and individuals. In other words, they are doing two main different things. First of all, they're encouraging hospitals to start making anonymized data available for open research. And on the other hand, they're also prompting citizens to become the ultimate owners and controllers over their data. And to do so, they've developed a bunch of different tools, but one of them is a dynamic consent that is powered by smart contracts and that enables the user to either allow or deny access to their data depending on how it's used. So this really answers to that problem of who has access to my data and how is it used because the patient ultimately has control over that data. During the COVID-19 crisis, um, another blockchain use case emerged as part of a consortium between three European countries, Guartime, which is known for their work they've done in Estonia, Open Health and SIGPA. And this project involves the creation of an immunity passport that could be used uh, after the lockdown. And the purpose of this immunity passport is to assist the real-time management of the different immune status of the population. So for instance, it could give public authorities uh, the possibility to secure access to sensitive locations such as um, schools or no nursing homes, and also ma make it possible to monitor in real time the acquisition of what we call herd immunity or mass immunity. Um, this consortium uh, was based on very strict ethical rules and um, they make sure um, that personal data is protected and immunity passports are only released based on certified, secure and on anonymized data. Now, I want to get back to our initial problem regarding the health industry that's struggling to find the appropriate problems to address with blockchain. It's, to me, it's undeniable that the COVID-19 crisis has highlighted 
a crucial issue patients are facing today and this is the issue that about their the way their data is being used blockchain is also undeniably an appropriate solution to address this need but i don't think it would ever be enough from working over five years in this area we have come to realize that there is no such thing as a blockchain project the, pro the, the problem, the projects that truly solve problems and make an impact use a very wide variety of technological and non-technological tools, and that's important. And they bring a lot of value only when they're combined together. So we believe that healthcare stakeholders want to create more transparent and trustworthy relationship with, that pa with their patients. I think that's something that everyone is aligned on. But we also believe that patients should trust their healthcare providers to do their best to always provide them with state-of-the-art solutions. And this is something that should, shouldn't even be a question. However, what we also saw is that building these solutions without taking the time to clearly identify what patients want and what patients need, it was been keeping the industry from really uh, thriving in tech and the mix of tech and healthcare. So at 23 Consulting, what we try to do is to provide healthcare companies with the tools to fill unmet patient needs with very impactful digital solutions. Because we think that tech has the ability to change the way that we interact with one another. And we've seen that through a lot of different examples over the year. And tech has also the ability to create strong, stronger bonds between all different healthcare stakeholders. And we truly believe that it is our duty as companies evolving in healthcare to embrace that and do it in the benefit of the patient. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I hope this was helpful for your different project. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Anka, for your very impressive presentation and sharing those use cases with us. I would pass on the microphone to Christoph Kieselbach. So, um, hello from you, everyone. Thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting up to now. I hope I can match up to this. Also, my topic is a little bit more theoretical and a little bit more dry. So I'll talk a little bit about medical device regulation of digital health applications. And I will cover three short topics we selected before um, this um, day today. The first is a little bit about what is a medical device? What is a digital health application? And I will talk very, very briefly about uh, the German Digital Health Application Ordinance, DGAF, um, and I'll say some words about medical device regulation under COVID-19, what has changed at the moment, what are specifics that are uh, currently um, to be regarded uh, due to this pandemic. So all of these are, of course, topics that, that you can spend a lot of time on and I'll um, brush them very, very briefly, but I hope this will be informative for you nevertheless. So first of all, concerning medical devices, currently in the European Union, medical devices are uh, governed by three regulations, uh, which are directives. Directives are uh, basic uh, union requirements that must be adapted into national law by the member states. And currently there are three directives for active implantable medical devices, for medical devices, and for in vitro diagnostics, each um, taking care of a specific sector of overall medical devices. And um, what we currently have is a transition from these directives to two regulations. Regulations, in contrast to a directive, are immediately applicable, but law in all member states so they do not expressly need to be um, implemented in national law. And um, we're currently transitioning to two regulations, one for medical devices, which will include the active implantable medical devices, um, MDR, and one regulation for in vitro diagnostics. Um, currently, the date of application 
or the medical device regulation is May 2021 um, for the in vitro diagnostics regulation 2022, so one and two years from today, almost exactly. So um, for the definition of a medical device, what actually is a medical device, I um, use the definition which is currently in the upcoming regulation because I think this is the one that's relevant. It's very, very close to the current thinking. There are some um, specific differences, but I don't think they are um, so large as to interest in, in such a general introduction. So basically, a medical device, as defined by the regulation, is any instrument, apparatus, appliance, software, implant reagent, material, other article that the manufacturer intends to be used um, for human beings. So there are no medical devices for animals, always for human beings, for one or more of these specific medical purposes. So purpose must be a specific medical one, and then there are lists of possible purposes, diagnostic prevention and so on for diseases, the same for injuries or disabilities, then the investigation, um, replacement or modification of anatomy or physiological or pathological um, issues or states, on providing information by means of in vitro examination. The last part here is um, included because medical device or an in vitro diagnostic device is also a medical device, but a special kind of medical device which has its own regulation, but it falls under the same definition. So that's the one part of the definition. And the second part is that a medical device does not achieve its principal intended action by pharmacological, immunological, or metabolical means, um, which means basically it's different from a medicinal product from a drug which has this kind of um, mode of action um, that's present here. So medical device is something that acts on physical or chemical means um, and that has actually a purpose with a specific medical intention. Then there are some additional points included into the definition of a medical device. Um, also deemed as medical devices are devices for the control and support of conception. And you have devices intended for cleaning, disinfection, or sterilization of devices. So these are additionally regarded as medical devices. And then, and this is actually new with the upcoming regulation, there are a number of products without a medical use, without this specific medical purpose, which also will be regulated as if they were medical devices. They are listed in a specific annex of the regulation. This covers, for example, cosmetic contact lenses, certain cosmetic implants, fillings, cosmetic lasers, so a specific kind of product which is actually regulated as a medical device, although it does not have a medical purpose. What does this mean for, for software? Well, the first thing obviously is that software can be a medical device. It was explicitly listed within the definition of a medical device. As with all other medical devices, the decision is mainly based on the intended purpose. For software, you can assume that it usually won't have uh, pharmacological, immunological, or um, metabolic uh, way of action. So uh, basically, the intended purpose um, stated by the manufacturer, the one responsible for placing the device on the market, actually is the thing that's um, important and um, that makes the decision whether a software is a medical device or not. So it needs a medical purpose, a specific medical purpose. And this intended use is defined by the manufacturer in the documentation, for example, in the instruction for use, but also in something like marketing claims. So that's something that needs to be regarded, that it's not only something that is to be found in a theoretical documentation and you can market your device however you want to, but if as a manufacturer you make certain marketing claims, this influences and expresses 
the intended use you apply to this device. So depending on this intended purpose software might be a medical device and um, this leads to the point that software which has similar functionality, um, at least from, from basics of its function might be a medical device depending on how it's used. So for example, if you have an app measuring the heart rate for training purposes to say whether you're making progress with your training or whether you are within a perfect range of heart rate for training purposes, this generally does not fall under the definition of specific medical purpose. So you would have something like a fitness or wellness product, but not a medical device. If this app is measuring the heart rate for diagnostic purposes, for example, for the detection of arrhythmia, then obviously this app does perform some diagnostic action, something like data analysis for uh, means of presenting some um, data or some information on your actual physiological state and this would make the app a medical device. Of course, things are never as easy uh, as this, so there are a lot of borderline cases that are possible at the moment uh, with regard to the regulation. There is a specific guidance which um, defines a little bit more um, what questions need to be addressed um, to find out whether a software actually is governed by the regulation and is a medical device or not. And I think we can expect that um, with the continued use of the regulation, there will be more cases and more specific samples to um, get a better idea about certain borderline cases, whether they will be regarded as medical devices or not. What is the consequence if you have a medical device? Well, medical devices is a highly regulated area and to put a medical device on the market, you must perform something called a conformity assessment procedure. This is not um, um, an approval by the authorities, but with a conformity assessment procedure, the manufacturer essentially proves that um, their device conforms with the requirements by the uh, European regulations and documents this proof in a technical documentation. So, and because this is something that is essentially the um, responsibility of the manufacturer, there are um, classifications um, that are made with concern to the risk that medical device um, poses. Um, with class one being the lowest risk, class three being the highest risk. And for class one devices, this conformity assessment procedure is performed only by the manufacturer. So you have no one else taking um, place or participating in this conformity assessment procedure with some specific um, exceptions. And if the manufacturer comes to the conclusion that he has fulfilled the requirements of uh, the European regulations, then we, uh, he will um, sign the declaration of conformity, will put a CE mark on the device and can put it on the market in the European Union. For higher class devices, you need the participation of a notified body of a specialized company that has um, been granted the authority by the European Union to participate in these um, conformity assessment procedure and they will assess the quality management system of the manufacturer and all the technical documentation before the CE mark can be um, placed on the product. And you can recognize this that in this case the CE mark is followed by a four digit number that is specific for the notified body participating in the conformity assessment procedure. But basically, the main responsibility for performing this procedure and the main responsibility for declaring conformity is always with the manufacturer, with the one who is actually placing the product on the market. As I said before, classification is done in four classes, one to three, which is a little bit counterintuitive, but this is due to the fact that there are two classes, two to A and two B. Um, with increasing risk 
posed by the device. Here are some examples to illustrate this. So specific for software uh, under the MDD, under the directives that are currently um, applicable, no specific rules for software classifications were present. They were um, regarded as active, or software was regarded as active device, but no specific rules were there, which um, would often result in a fallback to the default, and this is class one. Under MDR, there is a specific rule for software, um, which possible classifications from class one to class three, and um, one sub-rule there, um, according at least to the guidance, is generally applicable to software, and this sub-rule uh, results in class 2A, and if you look at the examples in the guidance, there's only one example um, where, the, where a software would be class one, this would be software and app intended to support conception. This is something that can be regarded as a medical device according to a specific um, part of the definition, but that's not something that is a specific medical purpose. So um, there seem to be a lot of restrictions here. Um, also, you must consider other classification rules which might uh, result in a higher classification. So under the MDR, under the upcoming regulation, most software will probably be at least class 2A. So how does the um, concept or the idea of a digital health application fit into this? Well, um, the, there is actually in the regulations or in the laws, as far as I know, no definition of a digital health application. This has something to do with uh, German legislation. I'll come to in the next slide, um, but according to the um, BFARM website, um, there even is an English definition of a digital health application, which reads that this is a medical device with uh, certain characteristics. First of all, it's a medical device risk class 1 or 2A, so no higher risk class allowed. The main function is based on digital technologies, and these um, digital technologies are essential for the medical purpose of the digital health application. Um, then the digital health application needs a specific medical purpose, detection, monitoring, treatment, elevation of diseases, or detection, treatment, elevation, or compensation of injuries or disabilities, and it is used by the patient or by a service provider and the patient together. So there are certain definitions and limitations um, for um, a medical device software to be a digital health application within the meaning of this German law. Um, well, what does this German law actually do. Um, it was introduced in Germany, a change in the Sozial Gesetzbuch that um, uh, governs reimbursement uh, for um, drugs and for medical devices. And um, this change established the right of reimbursement for digital health applications, which are listed in a specific directory. And this digital health application ordinance actually details the procedure to apply for inclusion into this directory. And aside from being a digital health application as defined before, um, this application then has to conform with the requirements for safety, performance, and quality of a medical device. So obviously it must be a medical device that can be placed on the market and it must be state of the art with regard to data protection and security requirements and it must um, demonstrate a positive supply effect, so positive Versorgungseffekt in German. So if you look at this, then the digital health application in this setting is a specific kind of medical device and the um, laws in Germany to acquire um, certain reimbursement possibilities include additional requirements to the medical device regulations. They do not replace them, but you need to first follow medical device regulations and then as an add-on to get uh, the right to reimbursement to be included into this list. There are additional requirements you need to show under the respective regulations in Germany. So two last slides 
shortly on the impact of the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic on um, medical device regulations. Well, the first thing is that currently there are certain possibilities for special approvals that simply due to the fact that um, within the pandemic, they have a high need for specific medical devices or protective equipment. And um, for example, in Germany, uh, the government used the existing possibilities for special approval of medical devices, for example, for surgical or protective, uh, protective masks or certain test requirements have been introduced to um, give the possibility to place products on the market under special approvals. And the European Union currently is implementing legislation to enable certain EU-wide derogations. So currently also several other member states implement these derogations and in the future we might expect that this can be done on an EU-wide level. This is one of the consequences of this pandemic. And the second consequence is that um, the date I mentioned uh, at the beginning for the application of the medical device regulation uh, is actually um, what, uh, already a date that has been postponed. So originally um, it was planned that the MDR should apply from um, May 26, 2020. So right now we would have already um, um, MDR that's fully applicable and due to the pandemic this date has been postponed by one year. Um, the further dates that are given in the regulation have not been extended and have not been postponed but that's one very important effect of the current pandemic with respect to medical devices postponement of the application date of the MDR. So I put together some additional links um, which lay out some more information to the topics I talked about. Thank you for your attention. And this is our contact address. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christoph Gieselbach, for your presentation. And I mean, you could already see it. Both of them are experts within our Blockstart project, and they're both working on very different topics. But I mean, so are your needs. So if you think you could work very well with them, one or one of them or both of them within one of the modules within our Blockstart training program, so feel free to contact them or us and apply for a voucher.